Welcome to Evidence for Faith. It's your host, Michael Lane. So glad you're joining me today as we continue in our study on various translations of the Bible. Why are there so many translations of the Word of God that we have available today? What's unique about them? What's difficulties with them? The pros and cons of it? Are there any unique features? Um, these kind of things. How is it put together? What kind of translation is it? These are things we're answering about all different types of translations and and versions of the Bible. Well, today, uh, this is number 11, if you're following along through our, our broadcast here, these podcasts. Number 11 is, well, it's commonly called Philip's Translation or Philip's Translation of the New Testament, but actually on the cover, um, people seldom refer to it by its actual title, the New Testament in Modern English. That is what it's called, and it's put together by a guy by the name of J.B. Phillips, who lived in the ni- uh, from 1906 to 1982. So, Phillips' translation of the New Testament, um, or the, like I say, the New Testament in Modern English. Now, since this is just the New Testament, um, we're going to, we can't read Psalm 23 as we have been doing in every other lesson, a very familiar psalm most people are familiar with. So instead, I chose a passage out of the New Testament that most people are familiar with, most Christians in particular, very familiar with, and it's John chapter 3. And I'm starting at verse number 13, and I'm going to read through verse 18, a very familiar passage to many people. So um, we're going to take a look at this, and then we'll get into this version of the Bible and how it was made and why it's so interesting. So here's John 3, starting at verse 13. No one has ever been up to heaven except the Son who came down from heaven. The Son of Man must be lifted above the heads of men, as Moses lifted up that serpent in the desert, so that any man who believes in him may have eternal life. For God loved the world so much that he gave his only Son, so that everyone who believes in him should not be lost, but should have eternal life. God has not sent his Son into the world to pass sentence upon it, but to save it through him. And any man who believes in him is not judged at all. It is the one who will not believe who stands already condemned because he will not believe in the character of God's only son. So that is John 3, um, 13 through 18 in this this version. You notice that it's probably a little different than what you might have you know, be familiar with. Well, The Phillips translation, or the New Testament in modern English, the actual title, was actually, as I said, written by one individual, um, John B. Phillips, and I gave you the dates of his life. It was in the early 1900s to the mid-1900s. And he put this together um, the first time it was totally published all together, because he did this book by book. And he published the individual books first, but it was all put together in a compendium as, as one volume was in 1958. And I believe I have, I, I actually had, um, I don't think I have it anymore, but I used to have one of those versions when I was in high school. He also, there was a revision done in 1963 and there's a 1972, which is the most popular one. If you buy one today, it's usually going to be uh, a 1972 edition. Its readability is a little different because um, it, it's, it's written in a style, which you'll understand, but the readability comes out to be grade 10 in the United States. It's a grade 10 reading level. But what type of translation is this? Well, it's actually not a translation at all. It's a paraphrase. It's a paraphrase. Now, we just got done in the last lesson going through the message, and that was a free paraphrase. This is also a paraphrase. It's made by one person. And J.B. Phillips, what he did is he's, he translated this, and he, he used... he's. He was a very, very famous Greek scholar, and he used his Greek New Testament to actually just translate it. And in doing so, from translating his Greek New Testament into modern English, modern English, of course, being in the um, mid-1940s and 50s of of England, he followed a dynamic, or what we call a thought-for-thought methodology of doing this, instead of a word-for-word or formal. So it, the problem is it's not translated by a committee. Most of these Bibles that we have been doing 
outside of the message we just did, has been done by committees. In some cases, 12 people to over 100 people on a committee. So you get a lot of different um, views, and um, they can check each other as they're doing this. Um, it can it can be it's less biased many times when you do it that way. Here we have one individual person, so his doctrine is going to shine through in this, and it does. It does. Um, he attempted to do the same thing with the Old Testament. He actually did produce um, one book that contained four of the prophets, which um, we'll we'll mention that a little bit later on towards the end. But he never finished the whole um, the whole Bible. He never finished the Old Testament, and he died in 1982. Um, it's interesting because I guess if he had finished uh, all 66 of the Bible, maybe this translation would have been called Philip 66. A <laughs> little joke there. Um, very minuscule, but anyway, let's go, let's get past that. What was the purpose? Why did this fellow, this J.B. Phillips, um, why did he put this together? Now, first of all, who is J.B. Phillips? He was a very, very famous and well-known Greek scholar in the 1940s and 50s, and up until his death, actually. Very, very well-known um, Anglican uh, minister. He was, he was a minister in Anglican church in London, actually in London. And as he was teaching, primarily, he had a, he had a love for, for teens and um, his youth and his church. He found out that the, the youth in his church did not like reading the Bible. And primarily because they were using like the King James Version, which, as we've already covered in one of the first lessons we did, is written on a collegiate level. It's got that old English to it. And a lot of the teens, and I, I remember this even in high school, too, a lot of my friends and even people I know today who who have been raised in churches that just follow the King James, they have difficult times with it. It's it's not an easy translation sometimes to understand. So his youth wouldn't read the Bible. So in 1941, that was the year, the key year to hear, Phillips began to make a Bible that his his youth and his church would be able to read and would enjoy reading. Thus began Phillips translating his Greek New Testament into modern English. Um, and as he does this, because he is British himself, and this is being done in London, it carries the 1940-1950 London style of, of um, talking, and it even has, in some cases, some of the British slang in this. But it took him a long time to do this, because, like I say, in 1941, England was a little busy. That was, you know, when England is in the middle of World War uh, World War II, bombs are coming down, the, the uh, Battle of London's going on and stuff. So it was difficult for him to find time to sit and spend, you know, uh, weeks and days writing and translating from the Greek into the modern English um, at that time. So he had a hard time trying to do this. It took a long period of time. And as he would finish a book, he would get it published, and then they would they would put it out. And he just kept doing this um, piece by piece for the longest time because the war slowed up his work. Now, as I said, it's translated from a Greek New Testament that he had. And in doing so, when he finished this, one of the unique things about this translation, if, if you're a fan of C.S. Lewis, again, same time period, he was a friend of J.B. Phillips eventually. Because if you recall, C.S. Lewis, if you know anything about him, the person who wrote Mere Christianity and classic other works, C.S. Lewis was an atheist who converted to Christianity and became sort of like an apologetics um, speaker. He, he wrote and he spoke on evidence um, supporting the Bible. Fascinating. Mere Christianity is a, a classic work. Um, and so C.S. Lewis obtained a copy of J.B. Phillips' version of the New Testament. And when he read this, he gave it very high praise. Matter of fact, Lewis wrote, and I'll quote, it's like looking at a familiar picture after it has been cleaned, unquote. What he's main talking about here in C.S. Uh, Lewis's style of writing, he's talking about the old uh, King James Version that was very popular. And he says that was like the familiar picture. People are familiar, you know, people would be familiar with it and everything, but it's sometimes difficult to see clearly what's going on. And that's why he talks about G.B. Phillips has taken um, the Word of God and made it clean, made it easier to understand is what he's trying to get across here. Now, early versions, when he did this, 
Um, because J.B. Phillips is translating right from the Greek, um, there's no verse numbers back in those days when the, the original manuscripts were written. And they weren't added till many, many centuries later that we had uh, verse uh, and chapter numbers. So he did go ahead and put chapter headings, but he did not include verses in the, um, the oldest versions. The version I have here does not have, uh, that I was reading out of, it's an older version. It does not have any verse numbers. It does have chapter numbers in this one, but my original one, it did not. Um, that's, remember, numbers added to chapters and verses were added much later to help people navigate the Bible. Um, this is after the Reformation period. It starts getting people having uh, obtained their Bibles and being able to navigate it easily. That's why these things were added. So later versions of the Phillips version do contain um, verse numbers and stuff. Uh, matter of fact, I bought another Phillips translation just a few years ago, and this one does have verse numbers in it, which really surprised me when I read it. So they've updated some things to it to make it easier to navigate. Anyway, Philip chose to write the book. Now, this is, I, I find this so fascinating. He chose to write the book. When he was writing these books of the New Testament, he tried to get in the mindset of each one of the biblical writers. For instance, when, when he wrote uh, like Peter's epistles and stuff, he sort of thought like, well, Peter's not a very educated person. He was a fisherman. So let's try and take it from that type of personality to write it. Paul, on the other hand, was an extremely knowledgeable scholar, one of the, the highest scholars of his day. So he writes Paul's letters and epistles and a scholarly style of writing. Whereas John, John, very simplistic, a fisherman also, you know, he puts that type of persona to it. Luke, who was a physician, wrote uh, the Gospel of Luke in the book of Acts. He wrote, again, from a scholarly position. So he tries to get, actually, the uh, into the original person writing this through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit to give it a special feel as he was translating it from Greek into English. Uh, and it is written, as I said, another unique feature about it. It's British style, British wording, even has British slang, the British spelling of many words. Um, myself, having taught in the Bahamas, I learned um, the British spelling on many words, and it took me years to switch that back to the American system. But even so, there are some problems with this, um, this version, this New Testament in modern English by J.B. Phillips. First of all, as we already stated, it's not a true translation. It's, it's just not. It's the work of one man. Um, some people right there will just throw it away. No, I find it, I have always found this a very interesting Bible. Um, certain areas of scripture, yes, they will carry J.B. Phillips' personal bias because he's an Anglican minister and he's writing the Greek, even though he's just trying to write the Greek um, into English. He's not doing it word by word. He's doing thought by thought to try and make it more readable. So he, he is giving some bias at times on his take on the scripture. And, and this can happen when you have just one person doing it. But that's not a reason to totally just disregard or call it the work of the devil or something. No. Also, Philip writes in the introduction of his version that he was not concerned about minute accuracy, but rather he wanted to convey the, and I'll quote it, vitality and radiant faith as well as the courage of the early church, unquote. So that was part of the purpose of him doing this. Besides to help the teens be able to understand and read the Bible and want to read the Bible, that is the way that he did it. Now, as we've done in every one of the translations, we take a look at Titus chapter 2, 11 through 13, um, because it's such a strong doctrinal statement. And I'm going to read this to you now. Um, the spelling's a little different. Of course, you can't see that as I'm here with my Bible open and reading this. But this is Titus chapter 2, 11 through 13, out of the Phillips version. It reads, For the grace of God, which can save every man, has now become known. And it teaches us to have no more to do with godlessness or the desires of this world, but to live here and now responsible, honorable, and God-fearing lives. And while we live this life, we hope and wait for the glorious Dinome of the great God and of Jesus Christ, our Savior. So 
Um, it's it's done a little differently. As a matter of fact, I see we've got a French term in there. Um, but that's how this thing reads. And the, the doctrine here, it's, it's as you can see, it's pretty good doctrine. So there's nothing really different in this. Um, let me just give you a few more little comments about this translation um, before I close out. Since Philip was, Philip's was a very, very highly respected Greek scholar in his day. And he always claimed that this was a valid translation. And he called it a translation frequently. But as we said, it is the work of one man and technically cannot be considered anything more than a paraphrase. Even though he is a great scholar, one of the greatest in the world at that time, he still is just one person putting this together and he's doing it by thought for thought. Thus, you're going to get some bias into the thing. Thus, I do not recommend this to serve as your primary Bible for studying New Testament. Um, you wouldn't want to do the whole Bible because it's incomplete. It's only the New Testament. Though, as I said earlier, he did complete, um, he did start working on some of the Old Testament books. And one of them, you can actually get copies of this today. It's called The Four Prophets. And it contains Amos, Hosea, Micah, and Isaiah. So he did do those books. But that's as far as he ever got. And like I say, that's a book called The Four Prophets by J.B. Phillips. But despite this, Philip's New Testament. It's a good source. If one wants Philip's opinion on a verse from the Greek, that's what you get. It also has, like I say, this definite British flair and take in its reading. Uh, overall, this is not a primary Bible, but to use it uh, as a good side source, I do frequently. I have Ever since I was in high school and got my hands on my first one, I have always enjoyed reading passages uh, alongside of my primary Bible. I still to this day will pick up sometimes my New Testament from Phillips here, and I will sit and read it to get J.B. Phillips, one of the, the greatest Greek scholars, his take on what this verse is saying. Um, so I always you know, like to do that with different translations. So that is the Phillips. Many people I have found when I teach classes on this, I seldom ever come across high school or college age students that have even heard of this, uh, this version of the Bible. You can buy it. You can get it on any Christian bookstore, basically, uh, or you can order it online. It's very easy uh, to get hold of. And you can download it in some cases um, through public domain on the Internet and, and read it yourself that way. But it's the New Testament in Modern English by J.B. Phillips. So that's that one. Well, thank you so much for joining me on this. And I so enjoy getting comments from you. Um, we've been, we do get emails at times and other comments that are sent to us. And we love to hear these things and like to hear your opinions on stuff. And so we thank you for doing that. And again, we are a listener supported ministry. We are looking for at all times people to help us so that we can freely, freely get the message of, of God, the word of God, uh, the gospel out to people. So if you would ever be interested in having um, Evidence for Faith come to your church or to your group, um, we do this. We do not have a set fee charge. Um, I was just at a place just recently and um, doing a conference, and they, they said one of the things that we absolutely loved about your ministry is that you do this for free, which they think is amazing. And the whole point is, I believe the word of the word of God is. It's a free gift from God, and I'm not going to charge people to be able to hear it. So... Um, We'd love to hear from you if you give us, uh, if, if you feel the Holy Spirit um, wanting to um, convict you to, to help support our ministry, you can go to our website and do it there. And we thank you so much, evidenceforfaith.org. So until we meet again, take care and may God bless. Thanks for tuning in, and thank you to our donors who make this program possible. Evidence for Faith is a 501c3 nonprofit ministry based in the USA. You can support this broadcast by donating online using the links in the description. And don't forget to leave us a comment, a review, likes, and shares to feed the algorithm and help others find this content. Thanks again, and we'll see you on the next episode.